My name is David Warner Matheson, and for more than a decade, I've been researching the connections between the world's ancient myths and the stars and heavenly cycles. I've written a number of books, starting with the Matheson Corollary, in which I investigate connections between stars and ancient myths. But at the time of publication of the Matheson Corollary, I was still taking the Bible literally. In that book, based on the hydroplate theory of Dr. Walt Brown, I presented some additional evidence which calls into question the theory of plate tectonics as it's presently taught to us in school, from elementary school all the way to postgraduate school. Among the evidence which I discussed in that book is the fact that ancient monuments, including those on the island of Malta and in the Boyne Valley in Ireland, as well as the pyramids of ancient Egypt and the Sphinx of Giza, and Stonehenge and many others around the globe appear to have celestial alignments to significant stars despite the fact that we're consistently told that plate tectonics causes the continents to drift by approximately 30 millimeters per year or just over an inch per year which means that the continents under these monuments would all have moved by many hundreds of feet in the ensuing millennia but supposedly have somehow retained their precise alignments to the rising sun of the equinoxes and solstices and other important days in our annual cycle, as well as to specific stars. And that appears to cast grave doubt on the argument for ongoing continental drift. I believe I'm the first to have written about this category of evidence, that is, the category of the precise alignments of very ancient monuments around the globe. But in the nine years since I wrote that book and started talking about it in numerous podcasts and blog posts, I've never been contacted by anyone who's interested in exploring this line of argument that I should say, I've never been contacted by anyone within academia who studies uh, plate tectonics as their profession. As I continued to pursue the evidence that the world's ancient myths were based on celestial metaphor, I discovered undeniable evidence that this assertion applies not only to the myths of ancient Egypt, and ancient India, and ancient Greece, and ancient Mesopotamia, and other cultures around the globe, but also to the stories in both the so-called Old and New Testaments of the Bible. And I had to go through a major paradigm shift in my own thinking because, as I said a minute ago, I was taking the Bible literally, but the evidence eventually became overwhelming. Between the publication of my first book in 2011 and my second book in 2014, I had to wrestle with the implications of that evidence, and I eventually changed my entire world view. My book, The Undying Stars, is the first of my subsequent books which presents evidence that the stories of the Bible, from first to last, are based on the stars, in addition to the stories of the ancient myths. And that connects all the systems of ancient myth around the world. And in that book, I also explore some evidence regarding an ancient campaign to replace that ancient wisdom with a literalist interpretation of the scriptures, an ancient campaign in which the secret society of Sol Invictus Mithras plays a central role, along with the early leaders of the literalist Christian church within the Roman Empire, who can be shown to have had the sun at the center of the theology that they taught and imposed on others, and who continue to align their churches and cathedrals with the rising sun, and who designated the day of the sun as the Lord's day, and replaced the ancient lunisolar calendar systems with one that was based almost exclusively on the sun. Since publishing The Undying Stars in 2014, I've published a number of other books exploring the abundant evidence that the world's ancient myths are based on a common worldwide system of celestial metaphor, including my series called Star Myths of the World, which so far includes Volume 1, looking at myths around the globe, Volume 2, looking specifically at Greek myths, Volume 3, looking at the star myths of the Bible, and Volume 4, looking at the Norse myths. I've also written some additional books exploring the connections between the myths and the stars. And by 2019, I'd learned 
so much more about the system of celestial metaphor underlying the world's myths that I went back and rewrote volume one of the Star Myth series, expanding it from 482 pages to 912 pages and titling it The Ancient Worldwide System, Star Myths of the World, Volume 1, Second Edition. And this year, I published my most recent book, Myth and Trauma, exploring the overwhelming evidence that the ancient myths have as a central theme the recovery from what is today known as psychological trauma, which has become a focus for some of the most cutting-edge therapists and healers in the past few decades, but which can also be seen to be a central focus of even the most ancient myths known to us at this time, including myths from ancient Sumer, in ancient Egypt, in ancient India, in the ancient Maya, and other ancient cultures. Needless to say, although I've now published over 5,000 pages detailing the overwhelming evidence that the world's ancient myths from around the world, including the stories in the Bible, but also myths from every inhabited continent and island on our earth, are based on a common system of celestial metaphor. I have yet to be contacted by a single academic professor of mythology or comparative religion or even art history to inquire about the undeniable evidence that should be of tremendous interest to those who study these fields as their profession and teach upcoming generations about these subjects. During all this research, I've been led by the evidence, and I've been willing to change my worldview, including making a major change to my entire line of thinking about the way I view the Bible and ancient history, when the evidence shows that my previous paradigm was untenable and in need of revision. And throughout that time, I've generally explained the heavenly cycles based on the conventional theories regarding the organization of the solar system in the Copernican and Keplerian from Johannes Kepler model of the Earth orbiting the Sun. But an intrepid and persistent reader in Western Australia and fellow surfer who goes by the nickname Peaker, which probably refers to catching waves near their peak, called my attention to the work of Simon Schack who's presented an abundance of evidence which calls that Keplerian model, Kepler's model, into question, showing that the Copernican heliocentric arrangement may be fatally flawed, may be incorrect. Let me state right away that Simon Schack is not arguing for a flat Earth or even for a geocentric solar system. There are people who still argue for a geocentric solar system, but rather Simon Schack argues that the Earth is indeed spherical, but that our solar system may be binary in nature, such that the Sun is not actually the center of all the orbiting bodies. And in fact, the ongoing astronomical research suggests that this assertion of a binary system may be true of well over 80% of the other star systems we've discovered. We've discovered that almost all of them are at least binary, sometimes more than binary, more than two stars in the same system, uh, making us uh, orbit around one another. I was initially resistant to such a radical suggestion, especially because the model proposed by Simon Schack is quite startling in many of its assertions, but having now read through Simon's entire book, in which he presents evidence that support his claims, I must admit that there's significant reason to suspect that the standard heliocentric model proposed by Johannes Kepler may be deeply incorrect. And although I'm not dogmatic on this subject, since it's not my primary area of expertise, I believe it is an extremely important area of study with profound implications that we should all investigate and that Simon's arguments are backed up with a lot of supporting evidence, which makes his model worthy of careful consideration. I would also like to state at the outset that my own research suggests that there is overwhelming evidence to conclude that the ancient cult of Mithras and the ancient founders of literalist Christianity worked closely together to seize political power in the Roman Empire between the first and fourth centuries, and that both of those two branches, 
both of those two arms, can clearly be shown to be heliocentric in their theology, which raises the possibility that the Copernican and Kepler models that were all taught, despite some significant evidence calling this model into question, might be part of some kind of deception with a purpose that goes far beyond what anyone might at first imagine on the surface. Simon Schack is half Norwegian, as am I, and his original last name is Hitten, which means a small house or a hut or a shack. And as a professional musician, he was given the nickname Shack based on this last name by an American musician, colleague of his. And he's written that 214 page book presenting an enormous amount of evidence regarding the problems with the Kepler heliocentric model and arguing for his alternative binary model. So much evidence that there's no way I can do it justice in this video. And I suggest that anyone who's seriously interested in exploring this subject order a copy for himself or herself and examine it in depth. But I want to mention some of the most compelling evidence from my perspective. I'm not an expert on the motions of the planets and the physics of that, and I'm at this point somewhat agnostic regarding our solar system model. The cycles of the heavens can be explained using different models, different hypotheses, and which one is the right model doesn't really change my primary area of study, which is the evidence that the world's ancient myths are based on the stars and heavenly cycles. How you explain those cycles is what we're talking about. The motions of those stars and heavenly cycles are seen from the Earth in the same way, regardless of which solar system model we use to explain those cycles and those heavenly motions. Simon's also done a lot of work on modern day traumatic events, including the September 11th, 2001 or 9-11 event. And while I'm in complete agreement that the official story surrounding that trauma-inducing event is completely untenable in the face of the evidence. I don't necessarily endorse every conclusion that other researchers, including Simon or those on his website or his forum, might put forward. Like the evidence surrounding the model of our solar system, I believe there's abundant evidence which calls the conventional explanations into question and which demand additional examination by critical thinking citizens because there's little doubt that we're being lied to, just as we're probably being misled about plate tectonics, and we're definitely being misled about the ongoing significance of the ancient secret society of Mithras, and about the evidence that the world's myths are all actually connected by a common system of celestial metaphor. Simon's research suggests that the calculations of Kepler's mentor, Tuga Brach, and the conclusions that Brach reached about the model of our solar system might be much more accurate and much more aligned with reality than the model proposed by Kepler and then accepted over the subsequent centuries as the conventional model. That's why Simon calls his model, which is a modification of the model proposed by Tuga Brach, the Tycho's system with an additional S on the end for Simon Schack because he proposes that his model completes the work of Tuga. Tuga Brach, of course, was born in a part of Scandinavia that's today part of southern Sweden, but which was at the time of Tuga's birth in 1546, a part of the Kingdom of Denmark. His original Danish name is Tuga Ottesen Brach, and he lived from 1546 to 1601. Now, there's various videos in which English speakers from different countries, including professors, pronounce his name in different ways, such as Tycho Brahe or Tycho Brahe or Tycho Bra, but I prefer to follow the pronunciation of the Danes themselves who pronounce it like Tuga Bra. For alle filosofer er utroligt, at der netop nu er fremkommet en stjerne på himlen, som er ny og anderledes end de hidtil. I en alder af 27 år har Tycho Brahe gjort en skilsættende astronomisk observation. En adelsmand skulle jo undgå at bevæge sig ind på områder, hvor han skulle konkurrere med borgerlige. 
Det gik jo ikke, at han begyndte at få karakterer, og så var der en borger, der pludselig fik bedre karakter end ham, så kunne man jo ikke opretholde øh, samfundsorden. Øh, jeg føler, at jeg spiller min tid sammen med disse adelsmænd. Der er undtagelser, men videnskaben ligger dem meget fjernt. Tygobras interesse for astronomien og astrologien, den går meget hurtigt, allerede mens han er i København, men så studerer i København. Der begynder det meget hurtigt at gå ud over, hvad man overhovedet kan kalde sådan amatørvidenskab. Han køber dyre og avancerede astronomiske bøger og sådan slags ting, så der har han hurtigt avanceret. As Simon Schack explains in his 2018 book, Tuga relied upon painstaking and precise observations of the stars and planets and proposed a model which has been dubbed geoheliocentric in nature, in which the sun revolves around the earth but with an orbit that intersects that of Mars. Let me say that again. The sun revolves around the earth but with an orbit that intersects that of Mars and which appears to resonate with similar models proposed independently by great astronomers of India, both before and after the time of Tuga Brach. However, after Tuga's untimely death at the age of 54, his former assistant, Johannes Kepler, took Tuga's data and used it to put forward a completely different theory, a Copernican theory, in which the Earth orbited the Sun. As Simon explains, quote, in spite of Brach's rigorous and unchallenged documentation, his own model of the solar system was ultimately flipped on its head by his assistant, the famous Johannes Kepler. Kepler used his master's observations in his laborious attempts to validate his diametrically opposed Copernican model. As only a few people will know, Kepler was ultimately, in 1988, exposed for having falsified Brach's all important observational data pertaining to Mars so as to make them agree with his heliocentric thesis. His, that is Kepler's, legacy is therefore eminently questionable. Brach had specifically entrusted him, Kepler, with resolving the bewildering behavior of this particular celestial body, talking about Mars, and Kepler's laws of planetary motion were almost exclusively mathematically derived from his relentless, quote, war on Mars, as he liked to call it. Just why the Mars data presented such exceptional difficulties should become self-evident in the following pages, end quote. That's from page Roman numeral I in the introduction of Simon's 2018 book, The Tychos. What Simon Schack demonstrates is that Tuga's model may well have explained the evidence much better than the radically different heliocentric model proposed by Kepler, which after a period of controversy became the dominant conventional model, despite the fact that observations and experiments since then, and continuing today, have cast serious doubt on Kepler's model. However, as Simon Schack also explains, Tuga did not have access to the more recent evidence, which shows that binary stars are extremely common. In fact, he didn't have access to any information about the existence of binary star pairs at all. And the data shows that binary systems are by far the most common type of system observed, suggesting the possibility that our own system is also binary in nature. So by adding some modifications and updates and improvements to Tuga's original model, Simon Schack proposes a new model for our solar system in which the Sun and Mars operate as a binary pair with Earth in between, in a system which is proportionally very similar to the famous binary system of the Sirius star system, in, in which our own Sun plays a role similar to that of Sirius A, and Mars plays a role similar to that of Sirius B, and our own planet Earth may be situated in between in a position similar to what has been proposed for Sirius C. Sirius C has been proposed by astronomers, but has not yet been proven uh, to be where they think it probably is. This arrangement would make sense of data involving the observed orbit of Mars, as well as the observed orbits of other bodies in our solar system, data which causes major problems for the conventional heliocentric model. So 
let's look very briefly at some of the most compelling evidence that Simon offers while again suggesting that those interested go check out his website at tycos.info as well as his 2018 book which is available to order through that website and which contains a wealth of data and evidence which casts grave doubt on the Copernican model and also information presented on Simon's forum at cluesforum.info which also contains discussion of evidence of mass media deception involving recent events not all of which I agree with but which certainly presents evidence which demands further investigation. One logical starting point is an investigation of the observed motions of the planet Mars which gave Kepler so much trouble and which are extremely difficult to fit into the conventional Keplerian model of the solar system with the Sun at the center of concentric orbits of all the planets starting with Mercury then Venus then Earth then Mars then Jupiter then Saturn and so on. Simon demonstrates that the conventional model has insurmountable difficulties describing observed behaviors of the planets perhaps most notable with Mars but also very notable with Venus and Mercury and even the retrograde periods of Jupiter and Saturn but as I record this on August 29th 2020 the planet Mars is about to enter a period of retrograde motion a planet is said to be retrograde when its progress against the background of stars from one night to the next moves from east to west against the backdrop of stars rather than towards the east the way we're used to seeing heavenly bodies progress each night most of the time. As most people learn at some point either in school or through some other source and as I've in fact stated in previous blog posts retrograde motion by planets is thought to be caused by that planet catching up and passing Earth if it's an interior planet orbiting on a track internal to our supposed orbital track around the Sun or by our own planet catching up and passing an outer planet if we're talking about a planet on the track outside of our supposed track around the Sun. In other words if we pass Mars on our track Mars will seem for a time to go backwards versus the direction we're used to seeing it crossing the sky from one night to the next. Just like if you're in a car on the freeway and all the cars are going the same direction as you, they'll seem to be going from behind you to forward, but if you pass one of them it'll look from your perspective like that car is going the other direction from forwards to backwards because you're passing them. That's the standard explanation for retrograde motion of planets. Mars will go into a retrograde motion beginning on September 9th of this year and continuing until November 13th. Now, as Simon points out in his book, if we observe Mars when it goes retrograde, it can be seen to trace out a distinctly looping path. If you take photographs of it from one night to the next at the exact same time, you'll trace out, you'll, you'll get a, a looping path for the planet Mars as it goes retrograde. This in and of itself is difficult to explain with the conventional model of Earth overtaking Mars on this supposed inside track around the Sun. As Simon writes, quote, Under Copernican theory, it is simply unfathomable why Mars, whose orbital inclination vis-a-vis -vis Earth's orbit is said to be only 1.85 degrees, would possibly trace such pronounced and steeply inclined teardrop loops whenever Earth overtakes Mars on its inner lane. Those retrograde loops are thought to be illusory caused by Earth's superior orbital speed with respect to Mars's orbital speed. However, mere orbital speed differential fails to explain why Mars would perform such peculiar teardrop-shaped loops. We should expect Mars to just reverse and resume direction in a straight line, or at the most, to trace only a very slight Z or S-shaped pattern. This because Mars's orbital inclination in relation to Earth's orbit is reckoned to be no more than 1.85 degrees as indicated in the Mars fact sheet by Dr. David R. Williams of NASA published December 23, 2016. End quote. That's from page 31 of Simon's book. You wouldn't expect a car that you pass on the freeway to make a teardrop shaped loop um, even if the car is slightly you know, larger than yours, like a, a truck, or a, a smaller than yours, like a small sports car. It still doesn't make a teardrop-shaped loop from your perspective, no matter how much faster you, you pass it. 
Even more troubling, Simon also shows that Mars can be observed to align with certain stars, just like all the planets can be observed to align with certain stars. And the periods of those alignments cause serious problems for the Copernican system. He shows the alignment of Mars with a star in Capricorn, Delta Capricorni, and then aligning again 546 days later, or approximately one and a half Earth years later, when Earth is supposedly on the completely opposite side of the solar system, hundreds of thousands of miles from its previous alignment with Delta Capricorni. Note that this alignment after 1.5 Earth years is extremely difficult to explain using the Copernican model in which Earth is supposedly all the way on the opposite side of the Sun because after a year plus a half a year we'd be on the opposite side of our orbital track. How could Mars line up like a rifle with the same star if we're now on the completely opposite side of the solar system. You can see that these two lines supposedly line up with the same stars. It's like a rifle going between Earth and Mars and pointing to the same star even though Earth and Mars are now 200 million miles offset. Those two rifles are not going to point to the same star. But as this animation from the Tycho's computer simulation, known as the Tychosium, or Tychosium, which was programmed by the brilliant Swedish IT professional Patrick Holmqvist in connection with Simon Schack and using accurate celestial and planetary data. This Tychosium simulation shows how this realignment after 546 days with the same star is actually predicted by the Tychos model and explained by the Tychos model of the solar system in which the Sun and Mars are performing a dance similar to other binary systems that we can observe in the universe around us. Simon and Patrick have made this Tychos model planetarium available for free on the web so you can go examine it for yourself. Note that you can change the perspective, you can speed it up and slow it down, you can even reverse it. And one of the most helpful features is this trace feature. I found that you want to uncheck this box here and then you can trace the motion of Mars, for example, or Venus, or even Jupiter and Saturn, and also Halley's Comet. Let's just note before going on that the ancient Norse were a seafaring culture who did tremendous feats of ocean navigation, and that this may well have something to do with the ongoing fascination with the stars and heavenly cycles exhibited by the descendants of that ancient culture with origins in the Scandinavian lands and shores, including Simon Schack and Patrick Kolmqvist and, of course, Tuga Brach. But to return to the important evidence that calls into question the conventional Copernican or Kepler heliocentric model, this alignment of a planet with a specific star is known as a sidereal alignment. And the period in between two such sidereal alignments is known as an empirical sidereal interval, or an ESI. As Simon Schack explains in his book, Mars will align again with a given star approximately every 707.5 days. But at times, it will realign with the same star in only 543 days. So these are known as the long and short ESIs of Mars, and they follow a known pattern over a course of 15 years of seven long ESIs and then one short ESI, like this, 707.5 days, and then it aligns again, 707.5 days, that's the second one, 707.5 again, third one, 707.5 again, the fourth one, 707.5, fifth one, 707.5, the sixth one, 707.5, the seventh one, and then 543 days for the eighth one. And then it goes back to 707.5 again. Simon writes, beginning on page 21 of his 2018 book, The Tychos, you may now rightly ask yourself, how is this even possible? How can Mars realign with the same star as seen from Earth in two wholly different time periods, 707.5 and 543 days? 
This is indeed a very good question, continuing Mrs. Stell Simon's quote. This is indeed a very good question. The short answer is, in the Copernican model, it simply can't. In the Tycho's model, it can and will naturally do so for demonstrable geometric reasons, which I will now expound." End quote. And skipping down, quote, as mentioned earlier, Tuga Brach's boldest contention was undoubtedly that the orbits of Mars and the Sun interact. Back then, Tuga's opponents would jeer, absurd, preposterous, sooner or later Mars and the Sun must collide. Today, their ways may perhaps be excused, for back in those days, no one was aware of the very existence of binary systems. And skipping down a little further, still quoting, the oddly shaped teardrop loops that Mars performs as it passes closest to Earth are understandably a most difficult thing for the human mind to process. They are caused by the spirographic pattern of orbits in the shape of circles and not ellipses or any other irregular shape as they move in relation with one another. The orbits are circles, breaking in for a moment. The orbits are circles, but the line that we would see would not be a circle. Continuing with the quote, the line it draws is not circular, but Mars is only ever moving in a circle whose center is itself moving in a circle. Once you overcome this cognitive hurdle, you will soon realize that it is nothing but a natural geometric consequence of a body revolving in uniform circular motion around another revolving body, the two of them remaining at all times magnetically attached. In fact, the Sun and Mars exhibit unequivocal evidence of being an interlocked binary pair. End quote. Interrupting for a moment, Simon Elsewhere gives a metaphor of attaching a small light to the spokes of a bicycle wheel. If the wheel is spun in one place without the axle moving anywhere, then the light will, of course, make a circle to the observer. But if the bicycle is pedaled down the street, that light will trace out the same kind of trochoidal patterns that we find in our solar system. Continuing with Simon's quote and skipping down a little further, we may thus envision just why it has been nigh impossible throughout the ages for any observational astronomer to detect this harmonious two-to-one binary dance of the Sun and Mars, since Mars never returns to the same place within a two-year period. And skipping down a little bit more, the motions of Mars posed the greatest difficulties to the astronomers of yore, Tuga included, who wrote, quote, It is evident that there is another inequality arising from the solar eccentricity which insinuates itself into the apparent motions of the planets and is more perceptible in the case of Mars because his orbit is much smaller than those of Jupiter and Saturn, end quote. And continuing with Simon's explanation, Mars has been the single most problematic body of observational astronomy, and the reasons for this should become clear as we go along. All over the literature, you may find statements hinting at the uniqueness of Mars's cosmic behavior in comments like, quote, among the planets, Mars is a maverick, wandering off from the different epicycle model more than most of the other planets, end quote, from The Ballet of the Planets by Donald Benson, 2012. And continuing with Simon's explanation, quote, of course, in the Tycho's model, one may easily imagine why Mars is a maverick of sorts, for the simple reason that it is the binary companion of the sun. In hindsight, one of Kepler's most famous quotes rings like a most appropriate omen, the irony of which I trust future astronomy historians will underline. This is Kepler's quote. By the study of the orbit of Mars, we must either arrive at the secrets of astronomy or forever remain in ignorance of them. End quote. It is thus extremely notable that Kepler has in recent decades been found to have manipulated the data collected by his mentor, Tuga Brahe, when, after Tuga's untimely death, Kepler, quote, going back to Simon Schack again, Kepler, quote, took the bulk of his master's laboriously collected observational tables and annotations, only to set about flipping Tuga's model on its head. Professor Donahue's description of how Kepler fudged his all-important Mars computations, molding them so as to make them fit 
with the core tenets of his thesis makes for a most compelling read, Kepler's Fabricated Figures Covering Up the Mess in the New Astronomy by W. H. Donahue in the Journal for the History of Astronomy, Volume 19, Number 4, and beginning on page 217, end quote. And that whole passage is found on page 20 of Simon's book, The Tychos. Simon also quotes a New York Times review of Professor Donahue's discovery of Kepler's falsification. Here's what the New York Times wrote, quote, Done in 1609, Kepler's fakery is one of the earliest known examples of the use of false data by a giant of modern science. Donahue, a science historian, turned up the falsified data while translating Kepler's master work, Astronomia Nova, or The New Astronomy, into English, end quote. That's from the New York Times of January 23rd, 1990. Now, let's try and understand why Mars exhibits this pattern of two different ESI periods, seven long ones in a row, followed by a short one. The reason is very simple. Once we understand this looping trochoidal motion proposed by the Tycho's model of Simon Schack based on Tuga Brach's original models, Mars makes a retrograde loop in seven of its returns to the same alignment between Earth and a given star. But after seven, it will actually align with that star right after completing a retrograde loop and then make its return to alignment with that star from the point of view of Earth just prior to its next retrograde loop, thus creating that one short ESI. In other words, it comes back without a retrograde loop in between. We can clearly observe this in the Tychosium planetarium that Simon and Patrick have made available to us on the web. Watch. Here's a long return, which includes a retrograde loop. And here's another long return, which includes a retrograde loop. But when we get to the alignment of November 2018, Mars has just completed a retrograde loop. And it will now come back to the same alignment with no retrograde loop in the middle, thus creating a short ESI. Then the next ESI will again be long because it will include another retrograde loop. Please note, as Simon Schack points out in his book, that the pattern of long and short ESIs for Mars was known to the ancient Maya and ancient Central American civilizations who were superlative astronomers 
and appear to have understood the motions and cyclical ratios that Simon describes in his book, a fact I'll return to in just a moment. But let's just meditate on what we've just observed. There's basically no way that the conventional Copernican model can explain the teardrop-shaped retrograde loops performed by Mars, and there's absolutely no way the conventional heliocentric model can explain these seven long plus one short ESI intervals for the planet Mars to realign with a specific star unless they want to argue that somehow Mars and or the Earth somehow speed up and slow down periodically for no reason every 15 years or so. Not every year, <laughs> but just every 15 years. They just orbit nicely for 15 years and then one of them either speeds up or slows down or both all by themselves. You might imagine a cannonball that flies for several miles and then for no reason just speeds up for a little ways and then slows back down to its original speed again. So it goes, you know, 15 miles and then it speeds up and then it slows back down to the original speed for the next 15 miles. But the Tycho's model proposed by Simon Schack, based on the exacting observation and best analysis that Tuga Brach could put forward, explains this baffling evidence quite elegantly. Now, it doesn't mean that his model is automatically the only way to explain the evidence, but his model certainly does explain the evidence and much other evidence which absolutely doesn't fit within the conventional model, including the phenomenon of negative stellar parallax, which I will not go into in this video, but which causes enormous problems for the conventional theory, and which is once again elegantly explained by the Tycho's model, but which is not explained by the Copernican model. And so even to this day, modern astronomers cannot explain negative stellar parallax. They basically try to ignore it or say it's just an error in the observations. And Simon goes into that in his book, and it's devastating to the Copernican model. But in addition to negative stellar parallax, other evidence that the Copernican model can't handle, but the Tycho's model explains very nicely, include the lunar sidereal period of our own moon, the observable sidereal alignments of Venus and Mercury, the calculations of solar versus sidereal day, and also solar versus sidereal year, the shape of the famous analemma, the position of the asteroid belt, the duration of our periodic meteor showers, the alternately tilted path of sunspots on the sun, and even the standard explanation for the mythologically important phenomenon of precession, also known as the precession of the equinoxes. So I know that we've all been taught the heliocentric model as the only possible way of understanding our solar system, but the fact is that we need to be open to other ways of explaining the evidence. This is the lesson taught in the standard mystery story pattern that we're all familiar with, where Sherlock Holmes or Scooby-Doo or some other detective or group of detectives uh, come along and the authorities are all trying to explain the evidence with one story and it turns out that a few pieces of evidence don't really fit the standard story and we eventually find that a different narrative or different model explains all the evidence in a much more satisfactory way. I was taught the theory of ongoing continental drift, and for years I had no reason to suspect that it might be incorrect. But as I noted in my first book in 2011, the evidence we find among ancient alignments, including at Stonehenge and at Newgrange and at Giza and on Malta and elsewhere around the globe, certainly caused some problems for this theory of ongoing tectonic shifting of 30 millimeters per year. It may be that the continents all drifted or shifted at some time in the remote past history of the Earth, but that they're not drifting or shifting in the same way anymore. And so similarly with the heliocentric model, and please note what I said earlier about the evidence of what can basically be described as a very powerful solar cult consisting of the partnered axis of the Society of Sol Invictus Mithras in the hierarchical literalist Christian church of ancient Rome, replacing the ancient wisdom of the world's myths with a new literalistic paradigm. I discussed the evidence for the importance of the secret society of Mithras in my most recent book, Myth and Trauma, which builds on some of the analysis found in my 2014 book, The Undying Stars. And this important subject brings us to one of the most fascinating aspects of the Tycho's theory, which is that in this model, the Earth does not remain stationary, in Simon's version, the Earth doesn't remain stationary, but it does orbit 
within the very center of the interrelated orbits of the proposed binary pair of Mars and the Sun. As Simon demonstrates using extensive formulas and mathematical demonstrations, quote, in the Tycho's model, all the celestial bodies in our system, including the Sun and its moons, he's talking about Mercury and Venus as the moons of the Sun, are moving synchronously together, which I attribute, I'm still reading his quote, which I attribute to a yet unexplained orbital resonance. This peculiar and wonderful discovery is even more fascinating when it is noted that the common unit is our moon's true orbital period of 29.22 days. The very fact that our little satellite, the moon, appears to be some sort of central drive shaft of our entire system should, all by itself, undo the Copernican theory. It makes no conceivable sense that our moon, which in the heliocentric model spins around Earth on its own course, corrected by nothing but gravity, while the two of them supposedly revolve around their own separate orbital slots, would play such a central role in our system. Instead, if we envision our moon as a body revolving around Earth at the center of our Sun-Mars binary system's very center, then the central role of our moon becomes a decidedly less mysterious affair, end quote. And that's on page 72 from Simon's book. And elsewhere, Simon also writes, quote, our moon turns out to have the most revealing period of 29.22 days, which I will henceforth call the moon's true mean synodic period, or TMSP. As mentioned earlier, still quoting, this figure provides us with the spectacular indication that our moon plays a central role in our Sun-Mars binary system. This stands in stark contrast to the Copernican notion that the moon is just a peripheral appendage circling around Earth. If that were the case, why would all of our system's celestial bodies in the Copernican scenario exhibit exact multiples of moon's average synodic period of 29.22 days? As mentioned earlier, there is no conceivable reason within the Copernican model for our lunar satellite to interact with Mercury, the Sun, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter at such exact multiple orbital resonances of 1, 4, 12.5, 20, 25, and 150. Our moon is ostensibly at the center of our system in the capacity of some central drive shaft for its cosmic companions. End quote. And that's on page 125. Simon then demonstrates that the ancient Mesoamerican civilizations appear to have understood the importance of 29.22 and the moon's synchronization with other orbiting bodies, including Venus, which is encoded in the famous Aztec calendar stone. When we begin to grasp what this information is suggesting, that the motions of the moon appear to be somehow connected to the motions of Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, and Jupiter, it certainly suggests that if all these bodies are somehow related and their motions are somehow related, interconnected, then their motions may well have impacts on us here on Earth as well. And of course, the planets in our moon are associated with the gods and goddesses of the ancient systems given to our ancestors in all the cultures of the world in the distant past. And that gives a whole new perspective to the evidence that a solar cult basically overthrew the ancient wisdom of the world's myths and suppressed it and threw out all the lunisolar calendars and replaced them with a strictly solar calendar, as well as the possibility that we've been handed a completely flawed heliocentric model in spite of its obvious problems in spite of its obvious contradictions from evidence that anyone can observe for themselves, a model that's been maintained for centuries as the only possible explanation, in spite of these flaws, and which was given to us by someone who basically took Tuga Brach's data after his mentor's untimely and suspicious death, and who can be shown, Kepler that is, to have actually falsified data in order to push this theory. And then that theory became the only theory that any of us are allowed to consider. And anyone who asks any questions about it 
is labeled as being completely ridiculous and unscientific. Is it possible that there's something very important in these interrelated motions of the moon and the other bodies of our solar system, with the moon being a key drive shaft, in Simon's words, and that someone or some group actually knows that information and wants to cover it up? And I'd like to acknowledge that a completely different researcher who has corresponded with me for years but who wishes to remain anonymous, whose name is Z, also has arrived at this conclusion independently of Simon Schack that the moon's cycles are of tremendous importance and that the abandonment of the ancient lunisolar ways of reckoning and their replacement with a strictly solar calendar may have been done for potentially nefarious reasons and represents a grave loss to humanity. Now there's much more to Simon Schack's Tycho's model, which deserves to be studied in his original text, the Tycho's book, and at his website, tycho's.info. And I will reiterate that my own research about the overwhelming evidence of a connection between the ancient myths and the constellations and heavenly bodies and cycles that we observe from Earth isn't really changed one way or another by the correct explanation of what's causing those cycles. We can explain the motions of the constellations and the planets and the sun with various different proposed models. But all those models have to explain what we see in the heavens. And the myths can be shown to be based on what we see in the heavens, whether what we see is the product of a heliocentric model, or of a binary Tycho's model, or even of a flat Earth model with a rotating series of interlocking crystal spheres, which of course I do not believe, <laughs> because as I've said many times, we can find abundant evidence that we're not living on a flat Earth. But even if we were, that wouldn't change the connection between the myths and the stars that we see. I hope that this video will be positive in your life in some way. There's no doubt that we have been lied to about many things about humanity's ancient history and also about traumatic events in recent history. But remember, the truth is up there and I am convinced that the truth will prevail. Thank you for watching.